Next, we have two speakers who've come to Supercon this year to share their work with the Zephyr Project, an open source collaborative effort uniting leaders from across the industry to build a best in breed, small, scalable, real time operating system, or RTOS. Please welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Jakub and Shimon Dukniewicz. Hello, guys. So, I'm Jakub, this is Shimon. So, yeah. yeah. Let me start us off. Okay, um, because I'm not sure like how familiar y'all y'all are with Zephyrs, so I'll just ask for a quick just show of hands who've heard of the Zephyr project. Okay, perfect. So, quite a few of you. Um, so I don't need to do a, a lot of introduction. Already actually had a great introduction of the project. Um, this is a pretty nice and catchy title, I think. Uh, porting an AI-powered wearable health monitor to Zephyr on open hardware. Um, and it would have been a great title if, you know, the plan, like, if our project were according to plan, but we all know that the reality of the embedded development world and the hardware development world is different. So if we were to rename the uh, presentation, it wouldn't be like this. It would be more like porting an AI-powered wearable health monitor to Zephyr on open hardware, but actually adding more Zephyr support for EOS as free, patching open OCD and debugging the bootloader. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of great fun. Um, but you know we needed something more catchy at the start. Um, so what will we cover today? Uh, Kuba, why, why don't you introduce it to us? Okay, so the talk will follow a standard war story um, outline. So think first we talk about our goal, the steps we were supposed to take to get there, uh, some hurdles, um, solution hints, and future work. So here you can see what will we cover. Uh, mostly some porting hardware tips, uh, a little bit about uh, this chip called EOS S3, a little bit about deployment of TF Lite models on uh, hardware, a little bit about debuggers, flushers, and some medical background. So who are we? So that's me on the right, that's Shimon on the left. Uh, I do mostly 5G networks, LTE, uh, some small embedded systems like modems and stuff as well. Uh, and I do a lot of sports in my free time. So uh, we actually came here all the way from, from Poland uh, to also to attend this conference. And, and while we're here, we're doing some surfing, we'll be doing some surfing as well. And this is Shimon. Yeah, so, um, hi. Um, I'm currently an open technology engineer at Avanat, so get to do a lot of cool stuff in open source, basically. Um, I'm also co-chairing the Carbon Aware SDK project under the Green Software Foundation. If you haven't heard about them, go check it out. Pretty cool initiative about like green software, sustainability in software. Um, and I'm also a final year uh, MEng computer science student at University College London. Um, we actually do together double in the areas of game development, uh, embedded systems, IoT, and I'm pretty crazy about windsurfing, not just surfing. So if you want to ever chat about that, I know you don't do a lot of windsurfing uh, in Southern California, but like, hey, if you want to talk about it, I'm, I'm still here. Um, so what was the motivation for our project, the original one? Um, why did we even do it? Um, we chose to do this, uh, to solve this problem, the actual problem we're solving, I know we may, we may have not introduced it properly yet, was to uh, do a non-invasive uh, measurement method of blood pressure for, from, uh, I'll try to get this right, photoplethysmography, so PPG, using an SpO2 sensor. And the reason we chose to do it, that was back in 2020. So we all know uh, what overwhelmed the healthcare systems worldwide. And uh, one of the big issues at, the, at, the, at that moment was being able to diagnose and report some you know, abnormalities. Uh, one of the ways to do so was, was to check for hypertension and uh, elevated blood, blood, blood pressure. Um, and it's also pretty fun to, to learn new things, trying to solve well, important, important problems. 
Um, so the original plan. Um, do you want to go through that? Sure. So the the plan, like the mm, original project, was basically uh, a part of Element 14 uh, design for a cost competition, where we were doing the uh, deployment of the model actually in the cloud, and we talked using Arduino Nano 33 IoT uh, with a Lambda that was performing the inference. Uh, and we had a PPG sensor that is uh, here, uh, and we displayed some things on the LCD screen. The board was different because here we have the new new one which uh, actually almost survived to the traveling conditions um, and yeah it was fairly simple at the beginning and it actually uh, we decided to uh, port it to a different hardware because of how finicky uh, Arduino networking was and we actually wanted to taste a little bit of more of Zephyr with this project. Uh, so the 3D design and printing was done by Shimon, uh, and uh, if someone is interested in more details about that, it, it, it's uh, on my blog. I will post a link later. So obviously, the next step was to bring it to open source and open hardware, since we all love that and are passionate about that. Uh, so here comes QuickLogic EOS S3, which actually came out not so long ago. Um, and why we were so enticed by it is because it runs uh, uh, embedded FPGA and a Cortex-4 MCU, which is fairly powerful. Um, but I'll tell more about why this embedded FPJ didn't work uh, in a moment. Uh, so here is like a system diagram, uh, and we can see in several uh, circled areas that, for example, it has um, a perfect system for sensor management, which is called, well, sensor processing, processing subsystem and a flexible fusion engine, which really were, uh, were the good idea for us to use. Uh, it also has the FPGA and uh, always on PDM microphone, which always, well, it can come in handy, especially in uh, low power applications. Uh, so yeah, so why it didn't work out? Yeah, so, um as I've mentioned before, and already spoiled it for you, the plan was different from reality. Um, and as uh, I found this quote, actually, because I wanted to know who said it, Helmut von Moltke said in the 19th century, um, oh, thanks, man. Is that good? Oh, perfect. Um, no plan survives a contact with the enemy. And in our case, the enemy was um, uh, trusting the, the, well, fully trusting the branding side of the SOC and not actually digging in the uh, Zephyr source code before uh, committing to the board. Um, um, so we may have mentioned this before, or maybe I haven't, but basically the, 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 the page said that the board was fully, the, the first uh, FPGA-enabled Cortex-M4 MCU to be fully supported with Zephyr Artos, with some other functionalities, you know, sounds great. Um, truth is, it wasn't fully supported, it was, bare minimum supported, didn't even have I2C support, which we actually really, really, really needed. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, oh, <laughs> before we talk about that, we have to talk about um, the issues we had with uh, flashing the board first, because um, yeah, first issue we, uh, we, we had was the board came in bricked. Um, and it was, and so we were very excited, you know, we got our new board, we wanted to play around with it, flash some M4 applications, just play around with deploying some Zephyr apps. And after browsing on GitHub and like, you know, not having any success ourselves with flashing anything, we realized, yeah, the, the bootloader just doesn't work. Um, and 
Luckily for Kuba, he had a J-Link, so he could like reflash it. I, because I don't live with him, I study in London, I stay in UK, I didn't have one handy. All I had was an ST-Link, um, and it, well, there were some issues with using it directly as well. Um, so let's go to the board flashing using OpenOCD. Um, there wasn't a flashing driver for, for that particular chip we're using OpenOCD. By the way, that, does anyone know what OpenOCD is? Uh, cool, for those of you that don't, OpenOCD stands for Open Own Chip Debugger, and it's like a pretty, well, well now, not old, but still a well-known re relatively project for um, debugging for, well, embedded system debugging and flashing. So if you ever use an ST-Link or something like that, you probably used it. Um, yeah, I quickly realized it's the, the driver is not there. Uh, so I went on the RAC and uh, a, guy, a guy relatively quickly replied to me saying that, the, that there isn't there, that, that the driver isn't there, but there is some patch I can try out. So yeah, I can try out the patch. Um, it's slightly outdated, so I need to do some rebasing, did the re rebasing, tried to run it, and bam, did not work. Um, who would have expected that? I spent a, quite a few days and hours actually uh, digging in the OpenOCD code, and it's pretty, pretty nice, it just like, was completely new to me. Um, so I've eventually managed to get some weird behavior, because it just didn't, re re um, the, the debugger didn't re recognize the on-chip uh, uh, memory um, on that board, the, the flash memory. Um, it just kept reading the wrong number, and I forced it to read the correct number. It eventually did read it once, but then again stopped reading it. So I decided to stop putting too much time into that for now, leave it for later fixing, and just get a J-Link, a smaller J-Link uh, to, to get up and running and start working on the actual project with, and not, you know, spend too much time on debugging the debugger. Uh, yeah. Um, so, both of us now had the boards up and running um, with the proper bootloader flashed. We were able to flash some uh, simple programs to it. Uh, yeah, and we are ready to, to, to start our work on it and add more peripherals communicating over I2C. Um, yeah, that's me. So that's me again, and uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, as you already know, we had our struggles, and uh, there are yet more to come. So uh, sensor manager was apparently a very um, good choice for us because it was low power. It had a. It was running as a special. DSP unit, which didn't require the Cortex-M to be functioning while it was doing its work. Uh, but we didn't find a programming manual for that. So how can we use it, right? Uh, so what we ended up using is direct I, I square C wishbone communication. Uh, as the marketing people told us that uh, uh, sensor manager is only useful in super low power applications that if we want, they can give the uh, programmers manual for us. But hey, it's not open, right? Uh, it's a paywall. So yeah, what we actually did to improve boards SOC and SOC's support on Zephyr. Uh, so there are a couple of links here listed, you can check them out later, but in short, we just uh, build upon what Ant Micro and Quick Logic did, a lot of work with the QWERC SDK, which is based on free RTOS. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, because um, it was, I put quite some time into, into doing that, so I'll happy to, to, to talk some more about it. Uh, basically, um, QuickLogic is the vendor that, dev that developed the board we're working on, and Ant Micro uh, supported, wrote some of the support for, for Zephyr for the board. Um, so props to them, because we had a good starting point. 
And what we are doing is basically we need to write an I2C driver for Zephyr for that board. Um, and we started by looking at the existing FreeRTOS code and then moving some of that code to the existing HAL, so the hardware abstraction layer for, for Zephyr. Um, and finally, adding the actual I2C driver um, for, for that board in Zephyr. Um, and this required us updating some of the uh, board's SOC, adding, uh, the, updating the board's uh, uh, device tree to, to also uh, reflect the, the other onboard sensors. Um, so without di diving too deep into the code, because that's, that's very specific, just to let you know, like one of the other blocks, well, blockers we had was uh, when pointing that HAL, like everything, everything was actually fairly okay to follow. It was just that one of the things we needed to enable was, a, was, a, was the flexible fusion engine, which was just used for, um, for communication, for, for setting up the clock for the wishbone bus over which the ice c 2 communication was happening. And to do so, uh, there was some, just some register enabling we had to add to, um, to the driver, to the board setup for Zephyr. Um, there was a small bug we had to fix on the way. Um, and it basically was due to transmission of I2C and that hardware abstraction layer, whenever there was an I2C message sent out and there was another message sent out following it, there wasn't like enough waiting time for the message to actually be cleaned from the transmission buffer before the next message came in and the, the message got sent through to the device. So we had, had to add like a uh, busy loop after, after each I2C transmission to just wait for the device to be ready to transmit again. Um, not really sure why it wasn't there beforehand, but hey, it was fixed afterwards. Um, okay. I just uh, want to add that uh, this is visible in the code at the bottom that is currently obstructed by us. <laughs> oh yeah, um, so it's right here, that's the, that's the call we're doing and that's what uh, we're running, the, the busy loop. Uh, just waiting for the uh, fle flexible fusion engine to be ready, so it just checks the um, status register checks if the wishbone bus's uh, status, status register is, is busy. So not super complex, just wait. Um, okay, um, where am I at, where am I at? Um, so after that, after actually being able to add the driver, um, here's just like a summary of uh, how, how we did it and how, what we had to do. Uh, there was a great resource from uh, 2022's uh, Zephyr Project Developer Summit, which the link is in the slides. I'm not sure if the slides will be up available somewhere afterwards, but if not, you can just grab me and I'll be happy to point you to, to, to the resource. It's a, just a super cool talk about doing basic uh, driver support in Zephyr. Um, it was a little bit tricky for a non-kernel dev and a newbie developer in, uh, for Zephyr, but manageable. It just required modifying uh, a bunch of Zephyr files um, it's listed here if you are more, more curious what, we, what you actually need to do. Uh, and also a helpful tip, always look at the other drivers and ask people on Discord. They're more than happy to help you out and explain what they did and how, how it's supposed to work. But honestly, the code base is really, is really nicely readable. Um, and after we had the driver up and running, we could actually get to the part we wanted to be at the very beginning of the project. So <laughs> writing the code for the project. And the first part was to just add the, um, add, add the sensor support. So the MAX30102 is the SPO2 sensor of choice that's soldered here at the bottom. Um, and when well, we had the driver ready, it was just as simple as adding the device tree definition and enabling uh, some kconfig switches. And it was running, like I, was, I couldn't believe my eyes after this many hours of just digging through the docs, reading through the code, like actually doing the work was just like a five minute job. Like 
Zephyr is amazing. Honestly, if you want to develop with it, it's, it's super cool when you have the support for it. Uh, yeah, when you have the support for it. But uh, there's a lot of, yeah, uh, just an FYI, I'm not, so I'm not mad, bad mouthing Zephyr. If you go to docs.zephyrproject.org and go to the supported boards list, there is a hundred of boards now supported with extensive driver support. So it's most of the time just check that it actually has the extensive support and if so, it will be as easy as this. Um, the next thing was adding the display um, and guess what, it was just as simple, just adding a device tree definition, adding, enabling the, a bunch of confli uh, configs, enabling um, dynamic memory allocation so you can do some uh, buffering of the, of the, of the content for the, for the display and, uh, and it worked. Um, yeah, um, before we move, we move on to the AI, deploying AI on the, um, on the board section, there's just a quick note that uh, for this particular SOC, if you ever want to, to work, work with it, using USB to uh, UART requires some FPGA code loaded. So the FPGA actually needs some code to uh, just pass um, pass the data from the, uh, from the USB pins and ports to, uh, to the MCU, to the M4 MCU. Um, and if you don't have a USB to UART, I'm sure you all know that you can just adapter. I mean, you can just use a different board to act as one. I just use an ESP32 and just plugged it in over, T, uh, over UART to, to act as one because I didn't have one handy. Um, yeah, and I'll hand off to Kuba to handle the final section of actually doing some AI on the, and uh, some ML on the, on the board. Yeah. So we're nearing the end of our talk, but I'll like to touch on the, well, quite, quite important part of the presentation here. So, um, yeah. So as I said at the very beginning, uh, the embedded FPGA was our target. But as it turned out, after reading the fine print, uh, it contained, well, it consisted of like it was capable of deploying just two 32x32 or four 16 by 16 multipliers. Uh, so it was not powerful for, I would say, any machine learning. Uh, so that's, where, that's why we chose uh, to deploy the model on, uh, on the Cortex M4, uh, so in software. Uh, and there was actually one library um, that was proposed to us. It, it's called SenseML. Uh, I tried doing something very simple with that, so just putting some samples into it. I, I collected manually and then running it through a model, and it just was, it just required you to do everything using this library, so in my opinion, it's not yet mature to be used as a standalone component. Uh, but, hey, TensorFlow Lite worked fine. Uh, so yeah, as I said, SenseML is, is, is an entire suite, so uh, if you are not familiar with machine learning or deep learning at all, then it, it might be a good starting point to just go through all of that using this single suite, uh, but if you have your model already trained and you want to deploy it or you have some data, uh, I would go for uh, separate solutions here. So yeah, TF Lite was much easier to use for us. Uh, so all we had to do was to tr uh, save the original model that I previously created using some open data set from hospitals. Uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and I converted the TensorFlow model to TF Lite model, which basically did some special, well, what it mostly did is it ran quantization. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that concept, it's basically uh, reducing the, like, remapping the data 
from a broader range to smaller one. So for example, float32 to, to 8-bit integers. And that's what the model expects. Uh, and what is being run under the hood uh, when you do it on, on Cortex, uh, well, Cortex M, Cortex M processors, basically, it runs ARM, SMCs, and then, which is like a super optimized intrinsic library for these uh, operations, like multiplication and, and some other. Um, so yeah, this one is not really worth it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about blood pressure prediction using photoplatysmography. I got it right this time. Uh, so how many of you are familiar with this world, this word? I mean, blood predict, blood pressure, yeah. All we know, we need to take care of, take good care of it. Um, but actually, uh, how many of you have worked with uh, biological data, biological sensors? Okay, a few. So, for those of you who haven't, uh, this is uh, photoplatysmograph. So, I'm basically using a MAX 30102 sensor to get uh, the uh, reflected. So, basically, how it works we strobe a bunch of LEDs in different colors uh, and get a uh, reflected wave upon which we do some processing uh, and it basically uh, reflects the flow of blood in our cells, uh, in our veins. And uh, yeah, what we can get from it is, for example, SpO2, which is uh, blood oxidization or heart rate. These are the common algorithms. Blood pressure was somewhat novel here. Mm. So I have a really nice picture that if you want to use, you're free to use it. I didn't find any uh, such picture on the web. I'm I'm proud of it. Uh, and it's basically describing all these uh, features that we extracted from the signal. Um, so we have peak ratio, systolic to diastolic, for example, cycle duration, and some deltas that are necessary. So um, you could put all the feature, like with a time signal, you could put all the, for example, one cycle of the signal through the model, but it would require it to be a little bit large, uh, and sometimes too large for a uh, embedded device. Uh, so what I did, I reduced the time data to six features that were uh, represented in the time domain, and, but, yeah, here we have the traditional trade-off, time versus space. Uh, if you want to have data sooner, that, then we just, um, then we just uh, put more of them to the model and it, it should crunch it pretty quickly. And on, on an embedded device, pre-processing can take a significant time, so it's a trade-off that we have to consider. Your mileage may vary, yeah? Uh, so it was trained using a public data set where the ground truth was taken from arterial blood pressure, so invasive method. Um, so this is not a state-of-the-art model, otherwise that would be, you know, uh, making some papers out of it and everything, but I'm not an, uh, an, an a ML engineer, uh, a data scientist, but these results, if you ever try to reproduce it, uh, they're pretty good, as, as at least for the non-invasive methods. I know that CNNs are much better, but also the CNN, a convolutional neural network, is basically much, much heavier than a sim 
simple linear regression that we did here. Um, so yeah, time for some results. And this was the um, a prototype of the entire solution before we managed to squeeze it here, which is my very poor soldering. Uh, yeah. Um, this is the old one with the proper casing, which we didn't adapt to this one yet. Uh, and yeah, as always, there is there is always some room for improvement and for extensions of the project, and here is where Shimon comes. Perfect. Thanks, Kuba. So um, what we still, well, can do and need to do after, after, after having this, like obviously, first of all, fix it so, so it can look nicer, um, and maybe change it from just being a, uh, a small project that we used to uh, learn more about Zephyr, but maybe make something more interesting out of it. Uh, we definitely, oh, those PRs are, sub this PR is submitted. It hasn't been merged up yet, needs some cleaning up. Um, so we need to submit the, and upstream the stuff we, all the work we did for, for the EOS S3 for adding the I2C driver, because I'm sure if anyone ever wants to use that board, and we already had someone reach out to us if this is ready to use, um, then they don't have to go, go through all that pain, and they have something to, to work, work from. Um, the open OCD patch would be very cool to, to get through, but I have to spend quite a few more hours to understand how, what, what's going wrong there. Um, but then you, could, you don't, wouldn't have to use a J-link to uh, re uh, unbrick the board. You could just use an ST-link or whatever open OCD, like a black magic probe, whatever open OCD debugger you, you have handy. Um, and, uh, okay, let me just remind myself what we also added here. Oh yeah, going, well, I won't go in order, but another cool thing we could try and do is if anyone is familiar with Renode or has heard of Renode, uh, maybe it'd be possible for us to do some emulation of the system using that. That was what we or originally were thinking of doing before we got the hardware. Um, um, some stuff we also, well, we're surprised by is when the board came in, it was, the bootloader wasn't there, so maybe uh, fixing the bootloader or changing it to a, a different one um, could be an option. And maybe reusing a different flasher, because the one we had, um, it's based on the tiny FPGA project, sometimes did some weird stuff. It still does. It still does. <laughs> Um, some acknowledgements, so shout out to uh, Chris Fritt and Hendrik Wix andersen and a bunch of other members of the Zephyr community for uh, helping me out and responding to me on Discord when I was asking questions about adding, uh, doing the drivers. Some of them were very trivial, some of them in my, uh, well, from my point of view weren't as trivial, but maybe they were. Um, and I'm hoping for further help from them and guidance for the PR when upstreaming it, and I already received some, so that's super cool. Uh, Paul Furster, so the guy from Open OCD, so for replying and guiding me in trying to debug the Open OCD uh, driver for USS3. Still haven't figured it out. Maybe eventually I will. Um, and uh, Robert Dawson, so who's the guy from Quick Logic that helped us out and pointed us to the helpful resources, as well as folks from Ant Micro for paving the way for adding initial support to, to the board uh, and Zephyr. Uh, and also to you guys for, for listening to us today. Yeah, that was definitely, you know, much appreciated. Uh, for further reading, we leave here, um, if you get the slides, uh, the <laughs> reference manuals uh, for that, as well as the talk I mentioned beforehand, which I really recommend. So Mastering Zephyr Driver Development gives a really good intro to the current state of, uh, state of driver development in Zephyr. And here's also a link to the data set we used for, um, for the ML model uh, Kuba prepared. Um, so some takeaways for you just to summarize, I know almost over time. Um, when choosing a board to develop on, uh, you probably already know this, uh, but just a reminder, check for its support in the system you're using, in our case Zephyr, make sure you actually look in the code and see it with your own eyes, 
right? The code is there, and some people have used it, then yeah, you're good to go. Document all of your progress. I had a very long uh, markdown file, actually a few markdown files, with all the weird stuff I tried out to, to get this to work, and what worked and what didn't, even like pasted like logs from, uh, from when it crashed or whatever, so I understood it, and I really did thank myself afterwards, because then I went back to some weird thing I tried, or something I figured out, and was able to apply it to eventually get to, to the solution. Um, how we are approach adding an I2C driver for Zephyr. So this can be definitely used for adding any other driver. Um, basically, look what's already there and eventually you might figure it out. Um, well, Google is always your friend. Um, and some of the stuff from the work Kuba did. So Zephyr works really well with TF Lite. There are actually de quite, a, quite a few demos, uh, I think, on the Zephyr on the Zephyr repo, if you ever want to try it yourselves, just go to the main Zephyr repo under the samples directory, there will be some TF uh demos. And the final thing is, um, so big shout out to the Zephyr project in general. When drivers are in place and you have the support, Zephyr just works out of the box and it's amazing and you can do really cool stuff with it. Um, yeah, and that is uh, all we had for, for, for you today, so thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions, we'll take them now. Just one thing, we'll give, uh, like, everything is open source, and we'll give the links in the presentation or, or later. And yeah, the first question is there. So, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, what we did initially was to just uh, upload the data to the uh, AWS. to AWS hosted model, which would then respond to us with a uh, with the inferred result. Yeah, and uh, the problem is that that with uh, Arduino, it didn't really manage to work properly because of some weird things happening with data being lost on the way and chip just, I mean, the board just freezing. So we didn't uh, manage to fix like the <laughs> these bugs on Arduino. And then we thought like, well, maybe it's better if we don't really need the wireless communication why not uh, just deploy it on a, it's a very small model, it's like, I don't know, um, a kilobyte and a half of, of data. So it's not much, and if the board supports as much, then why bother with the uh, communication? But for bigger models, yeah, this is how it's being done in the edge that, that you just uh, upload the model to the cloud and just send some data. But yeah, there's always trade-offs, right? So, any more questions? Right. If not, then thank you very much. Here are, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys.